Thanks for joining us, Jing. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we're the last uh, speaker of today. So a topic that we'll be discussing is uh, quantum compute. Yes. So uh, I think everybody hears about it, but actually I don't think anybody really understands what it is. So can you tell us a little bit about what it is that we are talking? Absolutely. So this is a difficult question. I get this question all the time. How can you um, explain quantum computing in simple terms? Um, and I think the only uh, uh, reasonable way to explain it is you think about a Superman who has superpowers. Um, because we are very familiar with what a general average person is capable of, but if, what if somebody has some extra power that, that is not very um, common to other people? Uh, quantum computing is like that. If you look at all the framework of computing to date, uh, we use classical notion of information to do processing. Um, but the quantum physics provides more generic uh, rules that uh, microscopic uh, world follows, which is not very obvious to us. So you just think of it as a superpower. It actually has a couple of superpowers uh, known as uh, entanglement and, and superposition uh, that allows us to explore this very large uh, solution spaces simultaneously. Earlier, Greg talked about uh, these very complex uh, biological mole mo molecules. Um, and in some of these molecular dynamics, really, the complexity really plays a role. But quantum computers will allow you to actually explore some of those very large levels of complexity. Uh, Jin -Sung, let's start to the kind of yeah. basics for sure. everybody that are in the, in the yeah. room, right? So just earlier, Kung talked about classical computer, yes. right? And uh, talking about the advancement and challenges of the most low Tinellis issues to the power mm -hmm and then being able to go into the, uh, what I call next generation compute that are more uh, domain compute and software. Sure. Now, uh, given that advancement in classic computer, right, and which is typically binary, right, one and zero, whereas quantum compute, what I understand, has many states between one and zero mm -hmm. with what, we underst what I understand is qubits, yeah. and the probabilistic states that are in between and depend on number of qubits, it gives you the complexity and amount that can yes. be able to solve complex problems. Yes. So tell us a little bit about this difference between classic computing yes. and quantum computing. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so let's say you have, if you have uh, 10 bits, there are 10, 24 different numbers it can represent. At any given time, a classical register will represent one of those 10, 24 possibilities. Quantum computers can actually explore those 10, 24 uh, possibilities simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the real superpower that I'm talking about. So uh, what this means is when you have a complicated systems where there are potentially very large number, an intractable number of possible solution spaces, uh, quantum computers gives you the possibility to explore all of them at the same time mm -hmm. to look for the right solutions mm -hmm. in many cases. So if I go back to my school days, yes? solving very complex linear algebra problems mm -hmm. with the multiple equations and being able to solve all those things in linear things in a, in a, a multiple state will help you to accelerate that problem solving time, I would imagine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's one way to understand right. it. So, so tell us a little bit about history of quantum compute. How big and how is it important for, to get to where we are uh, in terms of the US government? And I think Greg talked about DARPA. All those things didn't happen overnight. So give us some history of how where we are in terms of state of union mm -hmm. from historical perspective and yeah. where we are and where we're going. OK, great. Uh, so the first idea of using this potentially quantum superpower to do computing really dates back into the 80s uh, when Richard Feynman first thought about solving difficult problems in quantum physics, um, which is inherently uh, too complex for classical computers to, to tackle. Um, but that remained very uh, academic for a long time uh, until in 1994, um, a mathematician at Bell Labs named Peter Shor uh, invented an algorithm that allows you to factor a uh, product of two numbers very efficiently. Now, that looks like a very mundane problem, but that underlies the foundation of a crypto systems that we use today. It is very easy for you to take two prime numbers and mu multiply them, but if you're given the product, uh, finding those two factors tend to be an extremely difficult problem. And that is what we use as crypto systems, uh, very widely used, trillions of dollars of transactions are being made using this technology today. And he wrote a paper that proves that if you had a quantum computer, you can crack it, just like, uh, just like a re any regular uh, simple problem. 
Um, so that actually has triggered a huge interest, uh, especially in the uh, intelligence community and the government. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when the uh, exploration of uh, quantum computing as a technology really ser ser seriously started. So the history of that is only about 25 years old, but it is 25 years old. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the first decade or so, uh, there was a lot of investment uh, in basic sciences uh, to explore the realization of qubits, how well people can isolate that. Uh, but in my mind, about 10 years ago, um, one of the government agencies started a program where, okay, now people know how to make some individual qubits. Can we actually put them together and start to make um, multiple qubits and learn mm -hmm. how to manipulate them? And I think that really uh, triggered the technological progress that made uh, feasible uh, quantum computing as a commercially viable uh, approach. Uh, so some of those teams that were funded through those programs mm -hmm. um, have really led to all of the commercial activities you, you see today. For example, the Google team, the IBM team, um, the IQ team were all uh, supported by the same uh, R&D program from the government in the, that started in 2010. So today, uh, what are the uh, state of art number of qubits you can control? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so after about 10 years of that technology development with some real commercial activities, I think people are starting to build uh, <coughs> fairly complex quantum uh, machines with enough quantum bits um, where the complexity of describing this behavior of the quantum bits really starts to challenge the, the highest power quantum computer, uh, classical computers we have today. Mm -hmm. So you might have heard uh, two weeks ago, Google made an announcement that they've really done some computational task using their 53 qubit quantum computer, uh, which will take um, many tens of thousands of years for classical computers, the best classical computer to actually um, um, simulate. Mm -hmm. So we're actually uh, entering the technology regime where, yes, the complexity of quantum computers are starting to challenge the most powerful classical computers today. Mm -hmm. Now, what? I understand you have uh, some video to share with us on isolating and controlling uh, ion. Yes, so, so um, it, um, yes, this actually, the, the picture you, saw, you see on the screen are um, our technology. We actually use individual atoms as a qubit. And here you actually see, you're seeing the uh, fluorescence of uh, 25 ions. These are atomic, e each of these dots corresponds to individual atoms, which you use as qubits. So we can actually trap these qubits in a, in a linear chain, and we shine laser beams that are tightly focused to actually ex, uh, explore and implement the gate operations that are needed to do the quantum computation. So my understanding is really in quantum compute, this isolation from knowledge and the uh, magnetic or electrical, all these properties is really critical, yes. and there are two approaches to do that. Yes. And uh, you are using one of the approaches. Yes. Uh, ion uh, trapping, and the other one would be superconduct yeah. your approaches. Can you tell us a little bit about two different approaches and why you think that your approach would be a better way to go? <laughs> All right. I think, I think the two approaches are uh, very uh, complementary, and they both face uh, opportunities and challenges. So in one um, camp, uh, we use solid-state devices, very similar to how silicon devices have really led the, the information revolution in the classical domain. Um, so here, um, they fabricate qubits, very similar to we fabricate, like us fabricating transistors. Um, the advantage is we get to leverage this tremendous silicon fabrication uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. to actually print uh, qubits at scale. Um, the downside is uh, each qubit that you print tend to be slightly different because there are some very small manufacturing errors. Uh, it turns out that for digital processors, we can overcome those variations, but in, class, in quantum computing, we actually have to be worried about how to manipulate them. Uh, so that's actually the solid state camp. Uh, on the flip side, the approach we take is we uh, use, instead of a man-made qubits, we take the nature's given qubits, and these are individual atoms. And the issue of making identical qubits is not a problem for us because every atom of the same species, of the same isotope, is exactly identical. Mm -hmm. um, so here, the qubits are pretty good, pretty perfect. Actually, they can be made uh, relatively perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of the challenges now um, uh, mounts onto uh, the engineering task of how to manipulate them. And there, our technology is not at the level of the silicon um, uh, microfabrication mm -hmm. capabilities are. So we actually face some challenges in engineering and building systems and, and operating them. So my understanding is that um, I think the Monday, I don't know if you saw the announcement, Microsoft announced that they will be uh, providing a service, uh, quantum compute service, based on IonQ technology. So I, I'm assuming that any time when you have a large corporations 
when it's commercialized, that's a big step in the direction of potentially uh, um, uh, interesting market. So can you tell us about, it is for developer community, it is for commercialization, what, where are we in terms of the, uh, your view of the, uh, the potential outlook on this? Sure. Um, I, I did uh, say earlier that we're starting to build quantum computers that are um, impossible to simulate with <coughs> classical machines, meaning we potentially have computational powers um, mm -hmm. that are um, starting to go beyond classical computers, and that is going to continue to improve. Right? Um, but at the same time, uh, it is not very clear exactly what this uh, uh, quantum computer power can be used for. Mm -hmm. If you think about the Superman movie, when Superman first figured out that he had superpowers, he was bouncing all over the place, don't know exactly how to use mm -hmm. it for something useful. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of in that stage. Um, so what is the best way to enable uh, those first uh, commercially viable applications? Mm -hmm. um, our uh, approach is let's make sure that we build powerful computers that are reliable, that people can use. And then uh, just like what, was, uh, uh, what uh, the previous speaker mentioned, let's democratize the access to it. We're not, uh, in a, we're not forcing only a few people who know how, how to build quantum computers mm -hmm. to, to use them but let's make it available to anybody through the cloud. So anybody with a problem, with an innovative ideas of how to use, uh, learn, think about how to use this superpower mm -hmm. to solve their problems. We will invite a very large amount of uh, development communities and people with problems to really come and explore, mm -hmm. to find if they can find the first uh, commercially viable applications. So really what you're announcing is really development platform for the potential developers to join in using that core technology looking for potential applications yes. that can fit into that advantage of quantum compute yes. environment, which tend to be solving few inputs and very large potential output scenario. Exactly. OK, yeah. great. Uh, I think you had some questions about me, too. Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> so <laughs> we can talk about that. Of course, if you, if you think about the world of classical computers, there are huge tech giants, and we can call them superpowers. <laughs> uh, so Samsung is a superpower in uh, digital classical technologies, computing technologies. Um, and we actually recently partnered uh, with Samsung, so they made some invest in, uh, investment in our company and our technology. Um, I'd love to see your views of how you feel quantum computing will um, fit into Samsung's future. Well, um, you know, I think that, that we all have been successful in some ways, and we're lucky to be, in a, in a way, uh, we took the wave of uh, uh, really the transistor transition, right, uh, and which is just semiconductors, and, and then products that are taking advantage of that. Um, today, I think we are investing now looking at three nanometer in, in a technology node. And, you know, if you think about three nanometer, there are very few atomic particles yes. in there, so we feel like we're going the same direction. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really expensive, really hard to do. And the question of also Dinelli uh, problem, that is the uh, power is only going up as you're going up to the scale. So you got this power challenges, and then you got the uh, stability challenges, and there's cost challenges. How many applications can afford even classical computer solutions mm -hmm. to do the advantage of the scaling and the approach we're doing. So this is why I think new approach need to come out. And I think new approach that uh, Kung talked about earlier is really great. Mm -hmm. uh, we also invest with San Monova, and I think ability to change the game with software 2.0 mm -hmm. and domain compute. These are all great ideas that could change the way we are doing things. And then, of course, we need to take a bet in case that class computer does run out of the juice, then we have to think about some other approach. Yes. And we are, that's where I think quantum compute comes in. And uh, we're not sure when it's going to be, but it's important that we are part of that because it has, if it works, it clearly has a lot of a advantages that, as you discussed earlier about simulations and, and compute and in the, in the stuff that classical computer really cannot do mm -hmm. today. Yeah. So that's where how we see the synergy on this that's discussion. Great. Yeah. Uh, we also look forward to, uh, as we, we're, uh, you know, the quantum computers we build uh, look like the very early days of classical computers. They look clunky, they kind of work, um, but you know, I think they're, the, they're not as highly uh, integrated and as we 
take that approach, um, we would look forward to the technical expertise of Samsung to, to collaborate. When, when do you think commercially viable in your view? I know it's kind of early because I'm sure if you ask the same question to early days of uh, folks that are developing transistors, yes. and the, uh, which is really the 1950s and 60s, early 60s, I don't think they would have imagined what happened today where we are creating chips I mean, some Bonova chips that they talked about, mm -hmm. it's a huge chip. Yeah. I just saw the announcement <laughs> yesterday. It's almost uh, 50 billion transistors in it. So think about the, uh, the kind of density we got to from one yes. transistor. Yes. Yes. Where are you in the curve? Are you 30 years away, 20 years away, 10 years away, or five years away? All right, so um, if you think about the first transistor um, that was invented, uh, it turns out the first commercial application of the transistor was not a computer. It was like a hearing aid, uh, transistor radios, and these actually provided uh, the low-power, portable, um, and, and very clean amplification technologies. Um, so, but it, it was really those applications, those niche applications, where uh, the value of a transistor was proven in, and then I think more investment was to ma made to try to make more complicated devices. And I think that's where the whole virtual cycle of uh, this ecosystem has, has really transpired. Um, I think for quantum computing, um, I am actually quite optimistic that in the next two to five years, mm -hmm. uh, we will find that uh, trend, uh, hearing aid type applications, where it's not going to be very widely available, mm -hmm. but it, will, it may fit a niche uh, applications, but it will actually solve some real commercially viable problems so that it can actually start to feed into the technology development. And, and then as we make uh, bigger, faster, and cheaper, uh, and better, more powerful quantum computers, the application space I'm sure will explode. Mm -hmm. uh, so in some sense, we are kind of where the transistor was invented, um, and we're trying to figure out you know, whether the first uh, hearing aid type application can be found. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some very promising areas. Um, of course, you know, these promising areas have to be areas where classical computers are struggling. Mm -hmm. and, and we heard about many examples uh, today mm -hmm. where the classical computers are, are struggling. Not all, not all of those are uh, pro uh, fit for quantum computers, but many of the uh, stories I've heard, I think, are where quantum computers can potentially really come and help. So I think we should open up to developers to come and figure out, be innovative about how to use them. Is there a physical limit in how many qubits one can have, or is it, how do you see that? Yeah, so is there a physical limit of how many transistors you can put on a square inch of chip? <laughs> and I think when we started okay, out... Okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> uh, so I think these are not fundamental limits, but mm -hmm. I think eventually it will be practical and technological limits. Mm -hmm. And as we continue to innovate technology, I think we can actually get to scales of quantum computers where remarkable things can be done. So if you bet on some killer apps that can drive the quantum computer, what would that be? I think in the, again, here I can only speculate because mm -hmm. the killer apps will come from nowhere. Right. It will be applications that we're not aware of today. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when, when Samsung made the first flash drives, mm -hmm. um, they thought it was a storage device, but it really did not replace hard disk drives at all. But there were digital, digital cameras and MP3 players, um, and app, uh, these are applications that did not exist, mm -hmm. where they actually took hold and then, and then started the, the evolution. So, it's hard to predict what the uh, killer app is going to be, but I can actually give some general ideas of where the opportunities mm -hmm. are. For example, um, we, we talked about the molecules, and, and these molecular configurations are extremely complicated. They're extremely complicated because they're actually quantum mechanical objects, and that's why the classical computers have real struggle uh, understanding these problems. Mm -hmm. So if we actually build a computer operating fully on quantum principles, can we tackle these problems more effectively? Mm -hmm. uh, the answer seems to be yes exactly where we can find a practically usable solution, I think that's still an open question. Mm. Um, so that, I think that's a, that's a big opportunity. Materials, um, another issue. Mm. Um, and uh, all these logistics problems uh, where we have so many combinatorial options, mm. um, these are the kinds of places where I think quantum computers can excel. So one last question. So Richard Freeman, I think the pioneer in quantum computers said, uh, I guess in, some years ago, that, that uh, going from classical computer to quantum compute is even greater uh, than going from abacus to classical computing, which is, I thought, is a pretty, pretty big gap. So do you see the leverage or the, the ability to the coders or the designers uh, that are using the current classic computer 
to the uh, quantum computer. How do you say migration? Okay, that's great. Actually, that was a quote by Bill Phillips, the Nobel laureate from 1997, who mm -hmm. invented the laser cooling technique, which underlies the, the core technology of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and here, the, the idea is, uh, it's really about that superpower, like mm -hmm. abacus, to digital computers, yes, there is a tremendous amount of technological gap, mm -hmm. but fundamentally the way we represent information is the same. Whereas in quantum mechanics, you actually open up these new su superpowers. Mm -hmm. So um, just like we uh, now have a lot of uh, young people who are trained to think algorithmically and, mm -hmm. and code, mm -hmm. uh, we need to train um, our new generation of people mm -hmm. to think about, uh, to make sure that they feel the superpower is very natural to them. Because mm -hmm. once they recognize what superpower they have, mm -hmm. then I'm sure they can find ways to uh, put them to use, uh, to do useful things. So the whole page of the use. Yes, and the it is all rings. about usage. All right, yes. <laughs> let's give a big part to the uh, innovator here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Thank you very much tonight for joining us.